The considerable number of weird relations that can be discovered within the golden rectangle implicate what's called the vesica Pisces, or two circles intersecting to make a lozenge or fish, the Pisces shape in the middle. This is a circle that circles itself and divides itself at the same time, just like the one numerically cut into itself to produce the sequence of numbers defining phi. It's no wonder that the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan implicated the vesica in relation to the 2D topology characterized by self-intersection and non-orientation. He emphasized the production of a void inside the vesica, where access is limited to a special kind of navigation around the margin, a double motion of twinned opposites that in itself is a mystery. No Lacanians have focused on the vesica and its relation to topology, let alone psychoanalysis. So we have to ask, how could we get from here to there, with there being an understanding of topology not as some abstract system, but as something that is the basis of cultural life? This introduction to the vesica is also an introduction of new terms I've designed especially to deal with this problem. Drawing from a little-known analogy Lacan uses in seminar 14, entitled The Logic of Fantasy. If we take him seriously, Lacan is saying that fantasy, the glue that holds cultures together by holding the symbolic together in the face of trauma, is nothing less than a 2D topology where non-orientation is the cost of closure of continents. And continence is nothing less than culture's ability to create the illusion that life can be held together. So let's start out simply with the basics, which is a set of numbers we call the Fibonacci series, where each number plays two distinct roles, that of a sum of two things and that of half of the sum that is about to happen. If we see the Fibonacci numbers as just numbers, we can forget the important clue that each number is actually a twin and that its other self is invisibly present. We can begin to see this twinship only if we understand the spatiality behind the numbers. As a spatiality, the twinship becomes clear. It's a before and after strategy that equalizes this temporality in multiple ways. As an inside and outside, as a greater and smaller, as a container and contained. In all cases, each Fibonacci number is self-enclosing and self-enclosed. It's both the same and different. This points to an importance of the role of the difference that makes each Fibonacci number able to divide and double itself. We can model this by putting the series on top of itself and jogging the two over by one position. The result is a series of fractions. 2 over 1, 3 over 2, etc., each of which is a successively more accurate measure of the imaginary number phi, which is not ever a natural number, but always a ratio. Despite the fact of never becoming a natural number, we find the golden phi everywhere in nature and even use it as a standard in studying animal and plant growth and a fixed measure in architecture. In a seminar 14 on the logic of fantasy, Lacan introduces the analogy of a slide rule to talk about the impossibility of the sexual relation. Really, he's talking about the impossibility of the phi from ever reaching the point of being a point, always being a ratio, or, well, a relation. So the analogy presents us with the blue and pink bars as being always blue and pink 
and present no matter how we look at the component parts. Lacan's algebraic formula, 1 plus a over 1 equals 1 over a, seems abstract at first, but really it's nothing more than a statement of the golden ratio. The 1 plus a shows us the relation of the top of the divided line to the segment under the 1, which Lacan shows algebraically as the little a. But we have to solve the equation because the 1 plus a on the right is over a different 1, not the 1 inside the blue. It's different because the equation states a ratio relation. The 1 is proportional to the a in blue in the same way that the whole bar on top is proportional to the 1 in blue. It's a little like saying that 2 over 3 is equal to 4 over 6. When we accept that the ones in the equation are really two different things, we first multiply both sides by the little a to get a plus a squared on the left and 1 times 1 on the right. 1 times 1 is a little odd here because we think that it's simply a matter of multiplying something by itself. But the two ones are really different, so the multiplication pulls together a kind of dual, a composite. Out of this strange talk about the one, we can at least reach the sober conclusion of a plus a squared equal to this Jekyll and Hyde of a one. We will never know which one we are looking at when we see the numeral one. That is why Lacan became so interested in what he called the unary trait. The one is a trait, not a number. It's like the Fibonacci phi, something we can use symbolically without any problem, but also something that if you look more closely into it, dissolves into a mystery. The simple step of subtracting a from both sides of the equation allows us to see the connection to the slide rule above. Clearly, the one inside the blue bar on top of the line is divided by the blue a beneath it, leaving a pink area that is exactly 1 minus a. If this 1 minus a is algebraically equal to the a square, then we can answer the question of the pink beneath the blue bar. It's a square, which is kind of weird, but if you think of it, it is the little a that is less than 1. The powers of a are going to be progressively smaller and smaller thanks to the multiplication of fractions less than 1. This becomes a rule. The blue bar is to the pink bar what the number less than 1 is to itself times itself. With the rule, we can extend the principle and discover what Lacan wants us to see. Namely, that if you extend the principle, you have the principle of the principle itself. Namely, that with every step of the extension, there will be a reversal, a flip. So now we have two new ideas, the step and the flip. Then finally, something truly weird happens. We could carry this process of self-negating steps on to infinity. But before too long, we stop and say that infinity is not some inaccessible point out there in the distance, but the process itself of stepping and reversing. What reverses? It's both the red and blue bars, but these are different because they are left and odd on one side and even and right on the other. In other words, we now have a chorality that we didn't have before, 
or rather, had all the time, but we didn't notice it. We are close to Freud's observation that psyche is extended and knows nothing about it. At the same time, we see that the logical principle of self-identity, the X equal to X, is both a negation and a self-negation. By extending the powers of the little a, we have, at each step, used a different way to say no. Negation is not just the flip of the slide rule. It is the extension of flips that pulls infinity into the process and materializes the no as the name of what's happening. We literally pull infinity into the middle of extension, but we allow that it is non-orientable in order to be a point where things converge. If we don't have the logic of X is equal at least to itself, we have the new principle that X is never equal to itself, that it is radically self-different. This is like the Woody Allen joke about the chimera being a monster with the head of a lion and the tail of a lion, but a different lion. The one is the product of a one and a one, but a different one. The vanishing point in the center of things localizes infinity, but at the cost of making the middle into a no-fly zone. This is the only way we can keep things from collapsing into each other, which is useful if you are talking about having to maintain a difference between something like content and performance in human symbolic behavior. Lacan made this point when he distinguished énoncé, which was embodied by metaphor, and énonciation, played out by the mechanics of metonymy, or displacement. Only when these forces were held apart, in tension, could language work, and only then could you have an unconscious, which is structured like a language. The like in like a language means that the unconscious, too, is able to drive a wedge into the one, the unary trait. Splitting it makes it whole. This would be just an abstract thought if it weren't for the fact that culture uses this radical splitting to construct the holes that cultures depend on to see the world as a place that could be shared by a group of people who speak the same language and share a material reality. The infinity of the Mobius band, which is self-intersecting and non-orientable, happens inside the space that cultures construct in order to have this shareable world. But the uncanny insertion of something as twisty as the Mobius band idea of infinity means that cultures themselves are held together by the uncanny by the rituals and beliefs that are uncanny and can't be rationalized. In other words, resistance of the real of culture is the real of culture, that is, its effectiveness. Effectiveness is both a virtuality, a virtuality of reality rather than a virtual reality, as Jijic says, and a fifth cause to add to Aristotle's original set of four, the formal, final, material, and efficient causes. Effectiveness is what we need to address, but we need a new critical language to do this, where the virtuality of reality is what's at stake in order to see how each culture localizes parallax in the same way a stereogram localizes a new virtual world inside the one that is given to the senses. Just as the stereogram allows depth to emerge out of a flat pattern, cultural depth that everyone in the culture can see but others can't emerges out of the sense experience of the group as soon as the problem of individuality is realized as a problem. If no one else can stand in our shoes to see the world exactly as we see it, we still have the claim that they should and this claim constitutes the basis of our feeling 
that what we see is real and not an illusion. But of course, it is an illusion, a special kind of illusion we call the cultural fantasy. It's something we must achieve in order to enjoy what Freud called the discontents of civilization, the emotional dissatisfaction we must feel altogether in order to enjoy civilization as such. No pain, no gain, in effect, is the rule of culture's demand that we must suffer as neurotics in order to benefit as members of the club, what in psychoanalysis is called castration. And maybe now you know why there can't be a sexual relationship. But maybe without Lacan's slide rule, you had not realized how this was a problem of realizing how one plus one doesn't equal two. The next time you fall in love, don't forget. You will need a fantasy to keep love alive. But don't be too hard on yourself. As Shakespeare put it, lovers are in the same boat as poets and fools. The poets make culture possible to enjoy. The fools make enjoyment unlikely. There are two more terms in the list, both of which refer to the structure of the list itself, transience and anamorphosis. Transience recognizes the whole of the system, and anamorphosis is about the way one space can fit inside another. The four are already strange enough to give you an idea of how we have to look at the particulars of perceptual experience and label the parts that are not just the result of our fantasizing, our imagination, but are the cause. Without being both cause and effect, we don't have cultures, we don't have neurosis, we don't have dissatisfaction that makes life so satisfying. And without knowing these terms, we can't have a science, a knowledge of how we make our unsatisfying worlds so unsatisfying and still call them wonderful. <laughs>